everyone, um, I'm Rob Knight and I'm going to talk today very quickly about the company that I work for, SUSE, um, and then I'm going to talk about myself and share a bit about my personal story and hopefully share a couple of learnings along the way. Um, I welcome questions to come in through the chat that I'll get to at the end or you know if there's anything you you'd like to discuss via email it's uh it's on the screen there so just quickly um a little bit uh of context about SUSE we've been around for over 28 years now those of you working in the open source community i'm sure have come across some of our contributors we're best known for our Linux Enterprise Distribution SLES, but as time's gone on, we've supported our customers with all of their software defined infrastructure needs. Uh, we were initially founded in Nuremberg in Germany, but we're now a global company with uh, around about 2000 employees. Um, over the last few years, it's been a really exciting time for us. We've had a new leadership team, which is fantastic. We sold to a private equity firm, EQT, who have invested a lot in us. And very recently, we've successfully completed the acquisition of Rancher, which is a leading open source enterprise Kubernetes management platform. Now at SUSE, we have the concept of the power of many. And for me personally, that means working with as many partners and communities as we can possibly manage. But it's also about our approach to open source. We allow our customers to mix and match open source solutions. We don't force a specific requirement on any underlying operating system, for example, for our stuff that sits on top of it. And I think really when it comes to our commitment in open source, it's in our DNA. It's been in it since the start. Everything that we do is in the open. There's no complex licensing models or proprietary components. So now that's kind of the corporate bit about SUSE done, and I'm sure you're all wondering, who am I? So I'm SUSE CTO for Enterprise Cloud Products. As was just explained there, I deal with talking to our customers, partners, and analysis on a daily basis. I'm currently 30 years old. And I live in Basingstoke with my boyfriend, Scott. And actually just looking at that photo there on the screen just kind of uh, reminds me of uh, how much I've got to get to the gym after the lockdown ends. Um, I'm also the executive sponsor and the lead of Pride at SUSE, which is SUSE's LGBT employee network. And I'm going to talk about that a little later on. Now, when we were approached with this session and you know, got a speaking slot here, and we started to think about what to talk about. You know, I'm used to talking about our company and about our products and solutions, but I've never had an opportunity really to talk about myself before. And I think as an excellent point that Callista made there to, to Jeremy, giving your people and your teams an opportunity to speak and to share their story, I think is quite important. And that's really, I think, what this session is about. When I spoke to my colleagues, they just said, just talk about your story, Rob. You're in an underrepresented group. Just share one thing that's impacted you along your life in tech as a gay man, and I'm sure it will be a success. Because although, yes, I am gay, I've never really considered myself in an underrepresented group. I've got the advantage of being white and male, and that, as we know, often helps a lot when it comes to technology. But as I started thinking about things a little deeper, I started making some links uh, about certain things along my journey and, and my career, um, where the area of inclusivity and diversity has made a huge impact in that journey. So I'm gonna start at the beginning of my kind of career story. And that's when I was 16, I was just about to finish college, I'm full of energy, full of life and that beautiful ignorance that you have when you're quite young. And I sat in the park in a, with my boyfriend and some friends, and that's when I was just punched in the face. My boyfriend had his phone stolen. Now my nose has never quite looked the same again since. And you might kind of ask, why am I starting a story here? 
And that's because despite huge advances in terms of the law and the policies of government, one in five LGBT people have experienced a hate crime or incident because of their sexual orientation or gender identity in the last 12 months. And two in five trans people have experienced a hate crime or incident because of that in the last 12 months. Now those figures for me are quite shocking. And it got me thinking about that incident when I was 16. It also got me thinking about another incident when I was a little older and I naively tried to go and donate blood, but was forbidden. And that feeling is, I am less than. And it's relevant for my story because for me, that attack planted that seed of I am less than, that I'm sure many of you have experienced before if you're in a minority group. It makes you feel that you're not as good as a so-called normal person. And I'd always known that my sexuality had made me different. But that was the first time that I'd actually felt lesser than someone else, purely because of who I was as a human being. And I think that this is important because at the age of 16, I'm just starting out in life, really, starting to think of career options and what I'm going to be you know, doing when I'm older. And I'm already starting to think that I'm less than my colleagues or I'm inferior than my future colleagues. And it may sound irrational to many, but that really plays in with your overall mental health. And as we know, mental health can have a huge part when it comes to your overall career success. Now, going back to my journey in IT, when I finished college and I had my A-levels, initially I wanted to go to university and study environmental science. Now, I'd always been good with computers, that probably better than good with computers. I think my family will recall a family friend having to come over every other week to reinstall Windows 98 as it was back then because I kept breaking it. I'm not quite sure why, but I didn't want to go into IT as a profession, perhaps because I enjoyed it more as a hobby. But after I started at uni in environmental science, I realized that the course that I was on, it was more about the environment and less about the science, and it was the science that I was interested in. So I left. So that kind of had me at 18, wondering what I'm going to do. So I do what many 18 year olds do. I go and work in a contact center. And I worked in various contact centers over a couple of years, bounced about, and I had a rare opportunity. I got offered through a family friend the opportunity to interview for a service desk position, supporting the IT taking the phone calls for a large company. And so this is why one of my initial tips with this is that if an opportunity presents itself and you're in an underprivileged group, absolutely take it because it's not often that these kinds of opportunities present themselves. So you have to take them, or at least try to take them if you want, when they do present themselves. I think mean, that's also true because for many minority groups, minority groups, you're often starting off as a second choice or backup choice anyway. So I ended up working at big, UK's biggest optical retailer, Specsavers, and that was on their first line service desk. And service desk, I think, was a great link for me because I had the customer service experience from the contact centers, but I also had Linux experience, and that's what they were using at the time. I'd been playing about with Linux for many, many years as my preferred distribution of choice, long before I arrived there. And that was quickly recognized. So I was then able to apply for internal positions to go elsewhere. I soon found myself working on a project team and then subsequently working on the platform team. And this is where I got a chance to expand my knowledge. I was able to go on various Linux certifications and certify the knowledge I already had. I also then started experimenting a lot more with open source because I was a build engineer using Jenkins was pretty much part of the course. And also learning how to work with Maven as a non-developer, I had no development background, was also quite interesting as well. That's also when cloud started to become a bit of a buzzword. So I was able to research those technologies as well. In fact, I, I fondly remember 
installing OpenStack from vanilla upstream for the first time, which was a great learning experience. Now, I was there for a few years, and if I were to give any learnings from that, I think that my advice to anyone watching this starting out in your IT career, IT career is to take any opportunity that you have to learn. Now, even if you're young, take every training course, every certification that's offered to you. And if it isn't being offered to you, ask for it to be offered to you. Now, I know for me personally, I wouldn't have been able to progress to my next role if I didn't have that bit of paper that said that I could do what I knew I'd been able to do since a very young age. That next employer just simply wouldn't have taken me seriously because I would have only been 19, 20 at the time that I tried to move to them. I would also say, don't be afraid to jump. Now, what I mean by that is if you're in a role and what's on offer within that role or that company doesn't appeal to you anymore, don't be afraid to look elsewhere. And now, if you're part of an underrepresented or minority group, there's often job, job boards specializing in recruiting you. And those list uh, adverts from employers that you know you can at least trust a little bit when it comes to diversity and inclusion. Now, after I left Specsavers, I joined Cisco. And this was a new role, very different from anything that I'd ever done before. I think it was a huge chance to add more skills to my portfolio. I was able to talk with my teammates and learn so much about an area that I hadn't previously touched. But this is where culture comes in. And I think this is the first time that I ever felt excluded from a team. Because from the moment that I joined that team, there was an overwhelming sense of masculinity. In fact, the whole department was white men in their 40s to 50s. Now, this isn't necessarily a problem, and I have nothing but respect for those people. They were some of the you know, first-class engineers that I'd ever worked with before. But what that kind of led to within myself, because I didn't feel that I could fit in with that group of people, partly because of my sexuality, was isolation. Now, I couldn't join in with their jokes about women. Not that I obviously would want to. I would just have to sit there in silence. So while I hadn't had like an active hom homophobic incident since I was 16, very quickly I became isolated, or at least I felt isolated. Now, the role itself did involve flying a lot and traveling a lot in hotel stays. So connections with my team and with my colleagues were very, very important. Avoiding social isolation in a role like that is very key. And where I couldn't connect with my colleagues, it was quite easy to get uh, isolated. And then being away from my fa family and friends, that also had a huge impact on my mental health as well. Now, I'm not obviously saying that this is purely because of isolation, but in general, the LGBTQ community is far more likely to suffer from mental health issues than the general population. According to research done by Youth Chances, 52% of LGBTQ people reported self-harming compared to 50% of the heteronormative population. And 44% of LGBTQ people reported suicidal thoughts over the last year during the pandemic compared to around 26% of the of the heterosexual non-trans respondents. There's also been a recent study by Stonewall that's found that 13% of LGBT people aged 18 to 24, so quite young, have attempted to take their life in the past year. Now, I personally myself struggled with an opiate addiction for many years. That started when I was around 19 and up until around late 2018, I was addicted to painkillers of varying strengths and varying types. And unlike many LGBTQ individuals, I was fortunate enough to get the right help and support at the right time. And I'm now quite happy today living on medication assisted treatment. But if nothing else, I would say to take that as one kind of tip, that you don't have to let your mental health condition 
or even your medical condition hold you back from your career. If you're able to address it and work on it and get help and support for it, there's nothing stopping you from being as successful as you want to be. Now back, say four, three, four years ago, I never would have imagined myself in the position that I'm in now and in the, in the company that I'm in now. But being able to work on those, again, with support, I was able to get there. And I'm saying this now just to kind of bring that back to the isolation theme earlier, because when we're working in communities, whether that's in, in our companies or in the open source communities, if we're able to just put that little bit of extra effort into that social contact aspect, we're able to help some of our more marginalized friends be just a little bit less isolated. Now, Going back to where I left off in, in kind of my career journey, over the next few years, I tried a lot of different things. One of the most interesting things was when I worked in Oman, working on a lawful intercept project. And that was using open source software to support the government in their security efforts. And defense is something that I'd never worked on before. So it was quite a change at first. And as we entered 2016, I was helping to design cloud-based microservice architectures, in effect, to help a company connect toasters and microwaves to the cloud so that people could control them on their smartphones. Now, some people kind of laugh when I say that and they say, well, why would people want to do that? But I say that that was actually a learning opportunity for me to gain new skills in an area that I'd never done before. So that's why I'd recommend anyone that's new to computing and wants to pursue it as a career, try new skill domains and try to not be afraid to try new skill domains because you don't know where they could potentially take you in the future. And the other thing that I would say, and I think it, it echoes what we just heard from Callista as well, is mentorship. Now I sought mentorship from the CTO of a company I was working for around 2016. And part of that guidance I feel is really what helped me to get into the position that I am today. So I'd encourage you all to seek out membership, look for those opportunities wherever they are, and then take them. Furthermore, I also want to highlight the importance of networking. Many of us in underrepresented groups often struggle to network in the traditional sense. I know that my own personal struggles with addiction and anxiety can make those initial first contact attempts quite challenging. But there are specialist safe areas where you can connect. And if there's one that I share now, it's the LGBTQ people in technology Slack channel. You just find it at lgbtq.technology. I'd also encourage you to reach out to those peers, whether that's on LinkedIn or whatever, whatever tool that you have. Now, in the summer of 2016, I joined SUSE. And that was initially as a technical strategist. And that was great fun. I was flying around the world, meeting with our customers and partners. It's also one of the first times that I started to feel a lot more at home at a company. I felt really socially welcome from the start. I feel because of the policies and the type of team that SUSE had built, I wasn't afraid to come out, for example, and I was more able to engage socially with those team members. I think things really started to take off in around 2018. That's the time, as I mentioned earlier, that the company was sold to EQT and we were an independent company for the first time. Our new leadership team led by our new CEO, Melissa DiDonanto, really helped give a new vision to the company on how to approach diversity and inclusivity within an open source company. Now, although I'd always been out at work, the appointment of a female leader that was passionate about diversity and really echoed her commitment to that in every communication, every time we spoke to her, I think really helped me feel more at place within SUSE. Now, late in 2019, I, I helped to launch our LGBTQ employee network, which is called Pride at SUSE, and that's the one that I'm the executive sponsor of and still lead today. But this is a safe space for our LGBTQ employees and their allies to come together. We arrange social events, meetups, obviously without the pandemic, 
Um, and we just try to do our best to make our employees feel more valued. And the feedback that I've received from our colleagues is that this is an invaluable resource for them, especially during the pandemic when traditional face-to-face -face contact is obviously impossible. So I'd encourage you all, if you're in a position where you could set up one of these initiatives, explore it, ask around, speak with your network and see if they'd be welcome to it. Because we're seeing more and more of them sprop up, spring up in companies of all shapes and sizes. And I know for me personally, it was something that was really important and pivotal. But it was in early 2010 uh, where I achieved the promotion to CTO of Enterprise Cloud Products. I think I remember hearing the news just when we were starting to hear about a mysterious virus in China. Now, my prior roles had been very technical, you know, and, or, or even when I was within the sales team, they were still quite technical. And I found myself suddenly in a new position and joining the executive team was definitely a bit of a shock. I remember the first meeting I was in after getting the role and we were making an important decision on the future of one of our products. And I'm sat there thinking, this decision that I'm involved in now will have huge impacts on people's lives, on their jobs or where they're, what technologies they get to work on. And I think it was at that moment when the imposter syndrome definitely kicked in. Something I've heard from a lot of my LGBT friends is that whatever role they're in, they often struggle to feel as if they should be in that role. And now I know that this is commonplace in almost every industry and every role. But that's why I would encourage any leaders listening to this to speak to your employees, whether they're LGBT or not, and engage with them. Because through that communication, you can explore those kind of issues and then issue reassurance. Now, I definitely strived for this type of role for many, many years. But I think it wasn't until I had to make that decision that it suddenly really felt definitely very real. Now, I've also found myself involved in a lot of SUSE's strategic decisions around diversity and inclusion generally. And so I'd just like to give a very quick personal take on a couple of the things that I've learned. It's a well understood fact now that diverse teams are more innovative. They have a positive impact on a company's culture and ultimately they can have a huge beneficial impact to the company's revenue and their profits. And I think that companies and communities need to have diversity and inclusion at every level in their organization, right from the leadership down. And I think whether as employees or members of an open source community, you can push the leadership teams and you can push the focus groups to ensure that they are considering diversity and inclusion at every step along the way. Now, we all know that open source breaks down a lot of barriers and extends across every geography, every gender, every political affiliation and life experience. But with open source in particular, I strongly believe that there isn't a better industry in the world where we as technologists can strive for diversity and inclusion. So wherever you are at your career, you can help foster a more diverse and collaborative environment for your peers. Now, there's definitely some barriers into getting LGBTQ people in tech. And this is part of a pipeline problem because in general, there's just not enough representation. You know, there's, there's not enough people in prominent positions that young LGBT people can look up to and aspire. But also I feel that there's a mentorship issue. We need more people to step up and offer to be mentors for the next generation entering our industry. Then there's also the trapdoor issue. And this is where a minority group starts out in a career in technology, but then falls out and never returns. And we as community members need to ensure that every single one of them feels that they are valued and that we work to create a diverse workplace that attracts and retains that kind of talent. Now at SUSE, we tackle that kind of problem with an effective mentorship program, and we've seen it help with our, our retainment rates. I think another way that we can drive impact is ensuring that we nurture 
and develop role models for diverse individuals because people want to work at places where they feel that they're represented but also places where they have a voice and where they've got people that they can aspire to. And I think that every individual and contributor to open source has the ability, if not the duty, to ensure that they are as friendly and as welcoming as possible to diverse individuals, whether they're LGBTQ or any other underrepresented group. Now, before I wrap up, I said earlier that one of the bits of advice was to take every bit of opportunity that's given to you. And here is one such rare opportunity. SUSE is pleased to sponsor scholarship programs where we will enable 300 select learners to advance through Udacity's full cloud native application architecture nano degree program. Now this is a great nano degree program. And although SUSE is sponsor, sponsoring the program, it is run completely separate from SUSE by Udacity. So whether you're starting out in your career or you're an established developer thinking of making a move to cloud native, please check out the link and to see and apply if, if you feel it appeals to you. So that's the end of my session. As I said earlier, it's important often for us to reach out, whether that's for advice or for mentorship. And I'm happy to be contacted either through email, through LinkedIn, through Twitter. However, if you have any questions. I think you're muted. Uh, there we go. That was an amazing talk, Rob. And thank you for sharing so much of your life experience with us. And then making that fabulous offer. <laughs> so uh, we're open for questions. I see people are saying uh, thank you in the in the chat. But are there any questions people would like to ask Rob? So I have a question for Rob. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the question is around um, advice to Matt. I think you've Sue's is clearly an exemplar. So you've given us loads of good ideas. One of the challenges I that, that you face as a manager is that I, if when I inclusivity for women, I can generally I can see which of my staff are women. But I don't necessarily know unless they want to be open like you are. If my staff are have any other orientation, it's not for me to know if they don't want to tell me. And any tips for how you manage that? How to be inclusive without being intrusive, as it were? Yes. Yeah, so I think inclusivity doesn't necessarily mean you need to intrude in their lives because you can create you can create an inclusive culture and a diverse culture without even involving them, without even needing to ask the question. So this is more about, for example, having the right policies and procedures in place. Do you as an employer have a transitioning at work policy, for example? That's often a great first starting point for a lot of employers. Then moving on to things like code of conduct. You know, do you have a code of conduct or in your employee handbook things well defined that create an inclusive workspace? Now, that's almost the way to, some ways to do it without involving your, your employees and you know that there's hundreds more in that space. Um, but in a way, this is one of the reasons we created the Pride at SUSE Employee Network, because we knew that these people were out there and that they would benefit from having you know, an area that they could collaborate. When it comes to diversity monitoring, there are ways to do that that aren't intrusive in your employees' lives. But my number one guidance to you would be if you're going to introduce diversity monitoring, make sure you explain to your employees why and what benefit it has to them because if you're not doing it because you want to give them a benefit in some way then why are you doing it they'll get suspicious if that makes sense but i think that's a three hour presentation in itself right the, the answer to to, to 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 your question there but i mean there's just hopefully a couple of things there uh, thank you that that, that was uh, that was very helpful and i like the idea of things you can do without needing to uh, in truth. I also said just one comment. <clears throat> I'm very pleased to see you touching on mental health in um, technology because I think it it has improved in recent years, but it's still underrepresented. And one of the things we do do in my company is we have a free confidential 
uh, counselling service available to all staff. And I have no knowledge of who's attending that or other. All I see is the bill. And the striking thing is when we first set it up, I was surprised at how big the bill was, which suggests it was a good service to introduce. Um, yes. But, yes, um, abs absolutely. I'm very pleased to see you mention that. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. And I think, you know, these things are really important. You give a great example there of how you can support your colleagues um, who perhaps are suffering with a mental health issue. Those kind of support lines where they can give those initial three hours of counselling or therapy, they're hugely valuable for employees. We do have a question from Julian for for Jeremy asking about how how the your uh, program for mental health counseling works. Jeremy, uh, yeah, so we we just have a local. I mean, we're you know, the, the, we're transferred out in Germany, but in the UK, um, we're on one region. So we have a local, well respected, well established counseling service, and they have a list of who are our employees and they we have an agreement with them that any employee can go along and they have a number of programs from one to one initial consultation through to an essay program and we have said that we don't absolutely you must not tell us who they wouldn't anyway but um we will just pay the bill and actually we've even put in a protocol in place in case we get hmrc doing an audit on our finances and want to know where this money is going. So HMRC have authority if they need to, to go into the company without any information coming to us, because we thought that was the one way that information could leak and we didn't want it to happen. We've actually put a protocol in place to deal with that. And we're now trying to set it up for our German office, which interesting is in Nuremberg. So, yeah. Well, ask uh, Rob, I, I found it interesting that you talked about the pipeline and the trapdoor and how these terms across uh, different uh, groups. So we often talk about the leaky pipeline for women and the trapdoor. And uh, it seems like to me these are important concepts that um, people, if they're aware of, they can do a bit more to work on and fix. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think once you're aware of it, though, that's in a way when the problem starts, because I've often talked to, to leaders at companies and they're not aware of it. And then once they're aware of it, they're like, oh, no, now I have now I have to do something because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um. Great, Rob. What else do you think is necessary to provide better support for people that may benefit from it? So I would have actually said the employee assistance line as, as a really great first step. A culture as well of collaboration and communication is really important, not necessarily from a line manager to a line manager perspective, but me being able to, to, to reach out to my colleagues, to my peers as equals, and communicate on that more social level, even more so during a pandemic. Sometimes companies will put up lots of barriers and silos between departments so that you know perhaps people can't talk to one another as freely as they should, or the tools don't permit them to do so. And I think that you know removing those barriers is quite important as well. So sure issue i i don't know if you would like to comment on that the social issue is important because a lot of times people don't like the drinking culture around some tech tech cultures etc that puts them off um and that be uh because they don't feel part of it but um maybe they have a religious objection to alcohol or or maybe they just don't like uh, don't like drinking, or maybe they've got home responsibilities, so they they want to go home up uh, soon it finishes because they've got caring responsibilities. And I think um, getting getting a social perspective that is something that companies could work for. Yeah, absolutely. And I know 
what we do as part of SUSE, we have our employee engagement calendar. So these are a wide range of events, whether it's from just a monthly social gathering, kind of a water cooler chat, through having external speakers come and speak about a specific topic and then, then the, the group discusses afterwards. There's so many different ways, especially in the virtual world now, we're all linked, that employers can engage their employees more and get their employees more engaged with each other and the company. Because as now we're no longer in the office, people aren't talking to one another. That's when loneliness can set in. And then at the end of the day, productivity goes down. So there's a financial incentive here. Exactly. Um, so uh, we've got another in the uh, chat saying, good point with barriers. Why do you feel that? you are not equal so my reference to, to to not feeling equal during the session was it's hard to explain if you've not experienced it before and i'm sure ma many women have experienced this a lot um when someone engages with you and treats you as less of a human being someone's targeting you for a specific trait in my case it was because i was gay Oftentimes it could be because someone's wearing a hijab, for example, or just because of their gender. They're targeting you as a core. They're not saying, Rob, you've done something wrong. They are invalidating you as a human being. And it goes so deep down inside. It, it, it just strikes and it, it just hits you right there. And then that, that festers. That can persist. Because if you then don't have role models out there who, go, no, who, no, who are reminding you that you are equal, as everyone else, you can stay in that kind of that kind of slump. Thank you. I've just added a small comment in the chat. Equal pay gap! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! Exclamation point! <laughs> you know, it's great if your colleagues all think you're wonderful, but when you find out they're all paid twice as much as you, it does rather. Um, and maybe that's not the case, but you know, uh, still it does rather gall. Have we have we got any further questions for Rob or Callista? It's great you came back, Callista. I had a couple of comments just to add to oh, Rob's uh, comments on things. And, and Rob, I really appreciated your talk. Thank you so much for putting all of that uh, personal experience and out there. Um, I think that it is on us as organizations, as companies, as leaders to, in a way, put ourselves out there first. And so rather than, you know, surveying what you're sexual orientation is rather than sending out a survey send out a different message send out a we are starting an lgbtq whatever group or we are going to participate in a forum you know so stand up your values through your action prevent the leaky pipeline for women executives by offering benefits to new mothers give relax your requirements to come into the office. I have uh, someone on my team right now that's out for maternity leave and I'm like, take your time. And when you come back, work from home. You know, it, that's, that's the policy. So make a, accommodations before you even get the request because that makes you an attractive place to work and an attractive community to be a part of. So put yourself out there. Whether other people want to put themselves out back, that's, you know, that's great, but it's not, you know, the first step. The first step is ours. And so I would just, just offer that. And I think it's very important to continue to elevate and raise those voices. Not only do we need to do our best to bridge um, pay gaps, but we also need to just mentally get rid of the constructs of anyone being less than someone else whether that is because of dynamics of, you know, their, them as a human that you, you know, that you would approach things that way. But often 
We just need to take a colleague approach to everything. Don't speak down to someone because they are in a different spot on an org chart. Don't speak up to someone and not push back because they're above you on an org chart or put the org chart away. We are all here with a valid perspective and something to, to give back, something to contribute to the conversation or we wouldn't have spoke up in the first place, right? Don't ever shut down a voice and always approach your, you know, your colleagues as colleagues, you know? Sorry, I feel very strong about those things. <laughs> And you're, you're up, up, absolutely right. And I, I actually wish, because you addressed most of those as well in, in, in the first session, I wish that that session was sent out to every secondary school, right, and every university and played to people because it's those, those takeaways are so important. Those values are so important. Let me just share a couple of practical things because, you know, I should at some point talk about risk five. Um, some of the things that we're doing and um, that you'll see as we come back to more in-person events is giving out diversity scholarships um, is now part of our budget. <laughs> we just haven't done any in-person since that's happened. Uh, we're going to get there. But we've also um, engaged with Linux Foundation for our events going forward. Um, and that means that there will be daycare. There will be, you know, other things like when you get your badge, you can put stickers on that says, please engage me in conversation or, you know, give me space. Let me listen. You know, you can have all of these different variables that may or may not be a diversity metric, but may make you feel more welcome with whatever you're bringing to the party. Um, and that is important for us as, you know, not everyone feels comfortable in these large conference type dynamics, you know, but, um, you know, so there are various things that we're doing that way. We are engaging more proactively as well in sort of the, the technical uh, discussions. I would love to forge more alliances between communities that support and promote uh, diversity within our communities and we'd welcome that. We also are now maybe a year in on our code of conduct, which is a policy that is publicly posted and um, you know that we follow through with uh, you know in a confidential manner to both both parties, whether you know the one complaining as well as the one uh, that is is kind of hearing a complaint against them. Um, so, you know, these are important things that, you know, is another piece of being proactive about it. As someone who spent over 40 years working in British universities before I retired, and now uh, uh, additional time working as a full time professor. I, I highly uh, support the idea that SUSE is giving Udacity scholarships and Risk Five is giving scholarships. And I like your advice take every opportunity for training. <laughs> Both of you, I think, emphasize that. And um, I have to say, um, having spent my whole career working in computer science, but in the university context primarily, I took every opportunity to, uh, after I got my first degree to get a, a second degree, to get a PhD and in the university context. But the key thing for me in terms of networking and uh, not feeling so isolated because there are very, very few women who are professors of computer science in the UK. Uh, but the uh, thing that was really important to me was my membership of professional societies and before that user groups. So uh, I was a member of the Unix user group. But when I went to the University of Durham in 1975, we were the fifth university to have a Unix license. We ran Unix on our P11s and we use it in our teaching. And it gave me an opportunity to 
really get involved in the community. We would go around with RKO5 discs in our backpacks and exchange free software, which we developed as a community uh, around all around the Unix system. And uh, later, uh, I worked on uh, university spinoffs that were providing products and services around the Unix area. Uh, so I worked at Imperial College's software house uh, who developed the uh, ISAR IPS for BT. And uh, a lot of our uh, software that we developed was based on Unix. And through that, I got involved in standardization of C and POSIX and IEEE working groups on application portability standardization. And those are great communities, but uh, they they allow you to do a lot of networking. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that I got involved in BCS Women and setting up BCS Women. So a brand and that was really great. So it was seeing, you know, just getting together with more women in computer science. And uh, well, I've been involved involved in that for a number of years, and even now, I love it that I, uh, as I've retired, I'm in my seventies. I maintain the BCS Women website and uh, take an active role in encouraging other women to get us and you know supporting them, recommending them, writing recommendations for them. And I think that's really important. One thing in my, since I retired, I first I was a visiting prof. And if I would look, you would look at my entry in the University of Greenwich website, it says I'm a visiting prof. Well, I've been since 2000 when I retired. But uh, my head of the school, uh, managed to get me a uh, fractional post. So I became a, a professor again, a point four professor. Uh, uh, one thing that is great about Greenwich is it has a very diverse student population and a diverse staff population as well. And uh, in, throughout my career, I've worked in Russell Group universities. I've worked in University. And I have to say, the university community in the UK is, is a mixed bag, so to speak. And there are lots of pressures on um, uh, academics uh, working in the university context. But one thing that has and with respect to women in tech, programs like Athena Swan, which uh, focus on supporting, initially had a focus for women in the uh, STEM subjects in universities, but then broadened out to support all women, and then seemed to have broadened out even to support um, uh, LGBTQ and trans women as well, uh, trans men and women. So I think these initiatives are good. One thing that we did in the BCS, and I only got involved in this when I retired, was we set up workshops for women, women returners, women in tech, uh, to uh, under the heading of flossy to uh, get them familiar with the open source community because it gives them a chance to uh, learn about uh, open technologies. And we ran workshops on uh, App Inventor, MIT App Inventor and uh, Python, but also uh, uh, about open source projects, uh, open source licensing, encouraging the women to take part in uh, open source projects. And uh, recently, uh, one of the people who I would think of as a graduate of that, 
she's now uh, doing a PhD at the University of Lancaster. So that's, you know, a great result in my opinion. <laughs> and another aspect where I, because of the Unix community and then open source, that was kind of a natural transition, I would say. And uh, one thing is um, I was involved in European research projects using open source, promoting open source, making our research results available as open source. And uh, I think that those are great projects. And you also see how in other countries, um, more women are often involved in technical areas. And I think that's, uh, that's an area where hopefully we will be able to continue working. And uh, there's overlap between these open source research projects and uh, EU funded projects. And, uh, and also the earlier work I did in IEEE standards, that, that was also often there were um, people supported by their companies, but it is, it's still an international community of people collaborating and working together. So I think you've both been inspirational and uh, I really am at the end of my career, <laughs> but I still enjoy teaching uh, and getting and trying to encourage more women into uh, the area. I think it's harder uh, on some minorities to work uh, to if you're in the context of uh, working in a university, you know you so you have to go further back into the community to encourage people in tech sometimes. However, um, you know, I think it's important that people not only um, engage in technical work, but they also volunteer and give back to the community. So that's the end of my talk, I think. I. We're just gone one minute over eight o'clock, which is our finishing time. And really, I think our primary speakers, Callista and Rob, let's give them all a vote of thanks. And uh, it, it was a pleasure. You know, I'm humbled to be part of the panel today. <laughs> and uh, I really, I really enjoyed your talks. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, meet again. This so, has been great. It's I, I love participating in things like this. It's such a deep reminder of how important this is to me personally, as well as to the organizations that we're all a part of. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and Jeremy has thanked everyone in the chat. He said it was a great evening, and I agree. Oh, I'm just getting fired up. It's only 3 p.m. in the afternoon for me. Oh, right. oh, wow. <laughs> I like energized for the rest of the day now. It's eight o'clock. I don't. I don't think we're. Uh, I don't. We need to see people to contribute some comments. Oh, uh, we. Uh, there's a big vote from Julie on on emotional uh, intelligence as part of ethics should be mandatory schools. Absolutely, I agree. They can yeah. like etiquette school for everyone. <laughs> True, truly inspirational. Beginning of their career. That's another comment. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you all very much. And those talks will be up on uh, our YouTube channel very shortly. And I'm sure they will be um much looked at there yeah certainly yeah, there two talks i should be pointing people at because i think the nice thing about a fairly short format is you have to condense what you say into a very short period and that makes it very accessible and it's very useful and i've taken away um a few ideas uh, to develop um so thank you very much indeed 
all of you. Thank you very much for speaking. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll leave the chat open just for a little while for anyone who has any further comments or discussion. I think the, the downside of um, uh, doing this all virtually is that yeah, if we were we physically there, we would be all in the pub and then this conversation would go on and get more and more exciting as the evening went on. But uh, I hope uh, Callista, Rob, well, Cornelia, of course, we maybe one day invite you back in the future in person to come and speak to us in London. Okay. I'm afraid my talk was a bit impromptu because uh, Jeremy only twisted my arm to come and speak <laughs> yesterday. And uh, I've been doing exam questions up most of the day. Oh, we had another really enjoyed tonight. Thank you one and all.